Okay, here we are. Hello again, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. What we're going to do today is dive into the history of the New Testament, how we got to these texts. Um, and this is a conversation that's going to foreground our next week's conversation about how the New Testament as a canon, as a distinct set of authorized books came to be. Before we get there, we're going to talk about what the texts are and, um, and what the various options were to some of the folks who got together and decided what the New Testament texts would be. So um, I'm going to reiterate what our goals are for this experience this class um, one is to learn we're going to learn about some histories of these texts about some of the histories of this religion and also what we're going to do is some unlearning maybe to question some of the assumptions that we may be bringing to our conversation about these texts and the bible in general and then lastly, a goal that we have together is to empower us as contemporary readers or listeners um, to the Bible, of the Bible, empower us to feel as though we have agency to dive into the work of interpretation ourselves. And what we'll see is that even in the writing of these texts, what the authors were doing was responding to their contemporary issues and concerns. And so are doing that same thing, reading these texts in the context of where we are now is part of the biblical tradition that dates back to its origin. Last class, we talked about the formation of the Hebrew scriptures and that canon and the process that was started and restarted mainly with a view toward consolidating identity among a group of people who were scattered, who were having to reckon with devastation and trauma at a national level. And so, so much of what the Hebrew scriptures were about, taking oral traditions that dated thousands of years before they actually were committed to text, that a big part of that work was giving meaning to contemporary rather than historical events. Again, we're seeing that dynamism, the way that the biblical authors were responding to what was going on for them in the moment that they were writing. So before we move into um, today's content, I'm wondering, did anyone have a takeaway that they might like to share who was there from last week um, that, that they're kind of carrying with them into this conversation? I really liked how um, you not only, uh, you, you know, we talked, but then you showed some artwork that depicted what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, I think people who are like visual learners, that was really helpful for me. And also just like fascinating to see what these people supposedly looked like. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I appreciated that a lot. Cool. Thanks for that, Susan. Yeah, we'll look at some more art today, too. I like the historical aspect of it, because I, I, I love history, and I like to learn, well, where did that come from? So I'm glad you backed up and took that into account before we go forward. Yeah, good. good. Oh, yeah, me too. I love that. I forgot to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other takeaways folks want to share before we dive into today's content? Okay, well, we're going to start with Jesus. And I'm going to ask you all, if someone asked you to describe who Jesus was, what would you say? <laughs> who is Jesus? <laughs> Oh, yeah. A model for how to be in the world. A model. Okay. A model for how to be in the world. Okay. Great. Thanks, Gail. Here's the first word that came to mind for me was a prophet. Prophet. All right. Great. Thanks, Susan. A teacher. All right. A 
right. Diane. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, teacher. Anyone else? I don't know, but I think if I'd been living in Jesus' time, I would. He would have stirred my curiosity for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, another thing that um, is sort of a subject of debate among some folks is whether or not Jesus was an actual historical figure at all. And there are some people who believe that Jesus actually is just a mythological figure, right? That he wasn't a historical person. And, and they think that because there is a sense that the gospel stories, as we talked about last time and scripture in general it's not history it's not meant to necessarily record events in a journalistic way that we think of today scripture is doing something else and so that theory exists out there however the consensus among most scholars of ancient history is that jesus was in fact an historical person and he was a literal person and there's evidence beyond the biblical texts to support that so there is an ancient um an ancient jewish historian named josephus who is relied upon for a lot of this history around um the first and second centuries um of the common era formerly known as a.d and Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, who also makes mention of Jesus. And so there are these other, I mean, non-Christian sources for Jesus's historical authenticity. And so the consensus is that he did exist. But now that doesn't answer the question, what kind of historical figure was he? Was he a fanatical zealot caught up in the apocalyptic teachings of his time who sought to bring down the Roman Empire and was prophesying about the destruction of the world and this new regime coming to be? Was he prophetic in that sense? Or was he more of a teacher? These are the two, two things that we talked about just now that you all named. A prophet, a model, a teacher. And so maybe if Jesus wasn't one of these um, apocalyptic prophets of his time, was he more like a sage, a teacher of wisdom, a rabbi in that sense? Someone who wasn't necessarily predicting the fall of the Roman Empire, but was rather teaching and modeling another way to be in the world. And different folks have really different answers to that question. And so what I'm going to invite us to do is to dive into the gospel stories now and see what we may decide for ourselves. The goal of this conversation, by the way, isn't to have consensus. We may leave still with very different ideas about who Jesus was and what his work in the world in history was. But let's dive into the gospels and, and some of the other um, New Testament scriptures and see what we come up with. Little background though, the Gospels have lots of things and lots of places where they differ. Contextually speaking though, they have a whole lot in common. They were all written after the destruction of the Second Temple during the First Jewish Roman War. And so what that means is that they were written in the context of yet another historical trauma that the nation of Israel was facing. And, and, and so this happened as a result, by the way, of a Jewish rebellion in Judea, and the Roman government decided to lay siege to Jerusalem. And they did that by storming the temple walls, and anyone who tried to flee, they crucified. And so they surrounded the um, city of Jerusalem with crucified Israelites. And Josephus, this Jewish historian from this time, writes in somewhat vivid detail about the way the Romans did that. Um, our image of what crucifixion looks like is with your arms out and your feet down, but apparently 
people's bodies were contorted and put into all kinds of different positions, um, whether upside down or, or what have you. And so this was a gruesome period. Um, and so now this happened after what is recorded as the time of Jesus's life. So Jesus would not have seen this destruction. However, the authors of the Gospels would have seen it and experienced it. So that's something for us to keep in mind is that this is a reality that they are contending with as they are writing the stories of what happened to Jesus. So they're all written um, after the destruction of the Second Temple. And this is also a time when not only is the Jesus movement kind of gaining traction, this time around 70 um, CE or so, the Jesus movement is gaining traction, but so is a new form of Judaism, what is called rabbinic Judaism. After the destruction of the temple, now there's a question, where is the center of Judaism as a religion going to happen? And so there's a movement um, towards decentering the temple and suggesting that Jewish life can continue in the context of the home and in the in the growing number of synagogues that exist outside, again, of the temple as the center of gravity for Judaism. And so in addition to that, there was an incredible amount of infighting among the various sects of Judaism. And so we have the Pharisees that we hear a lot about, right, in Jesus's uh, sayings and Jesus's commentary. There's the Sadducees who were sort of a cultural political elite and there were zealots, there were varieties of people at this time who were vying for power, um, both in terms of their relationship with the Roman Empire, but then also in terms of their relationship with the Jewish people. And so, again, these texts are being produced in the context of strife and trauma and intensity. Some other things they have in common, they were all written in Greek. And what that looked like um, was that not only were they all written in Greek, they were all written in um, all capital letters. There was no punctuation, no quotation marks, no chapter separations. So all of the moments that we see in English translations of these texts, all the quotation marks around what Jesus reportedly said, all of the chapter separations, the verse separations, that's all stuff that translators have added to help English readers understand the texts better. They did not, those separations and those punctuations though did not exist in the original manuscripts. Additionally, what all the gospels have in common is that nobody knows who wrote them. They're all unknown authorship. None of them are signed by anybody. None of them um, make clear at all who was composing them. It's not clear that they were composed by a single person. Authorship of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, that was assigned later um, by various Christian bishops as they were forming the New Testament into a canon. And related to that, no original copies of any of the gospel texts survive till today. The texts that we have are all copies that are maybe second or third generation copies, in fact, um, and most of which come to us from a composition from around three, the 300 CEs. Um, and they don't all agree with each other, actually. The various third generation copies of these texts that we have there are minor differences among them. Any questions or comments just about that piece of things before we dive more specifically into in the gospels themselves? So Tony, how did these bishops decide that, oh, I think Paul wrote this or I think Mark wrote that? Yeah, they basically were thinking about the context of the communities that read these texts, and then they kind of assigned labels to them. There was tradition passed on from one generation to the next that 
um, this person or that one wrote these texts, but there, it was all based on tradition. And we'll get a little bit more into that next time when we talk about the canonization process. But yeah, it was, it was all Bishop Irenaeus was one person who decided that, oh, tradition holds that Matthew wrote this text, Matthew the Evangelist. Um, and it just sort of stuck. And it's we'll basically see how just happens. like a good guess. It, I mean, there was a there was a sense that um, I mean, yeah, there was a bit of guessing involved in the process, but it was more a sense of we're relying on tradition of what other people have told us and some context clues that we'll talk a little bit more about. For example, Matthew comes first in the gospel canon because it was thought that it was written first. And that Mark is an abridged version of Matthew, but in fact, it's the opposite, that Mark came first, and it provides a source for both Matthew and Luke. So we'll get into the weeds a little bit more about that um, later on. But yeah, that's, that's sort of where the, the authorship ideas come from. Any other comments or questions about kind of just this stage setting we're doing right now? Just that it's pretty much unknown by most everybody in the pews, I think. It's just not how Bible study has been done in, you know, in churches <laughs> for, for decades. And, and even, um, yeah, I, I suspect even in uh, like uh, church related high schools and so forth, I just don't, don't get that background. Yeah, it's true. It's true. We don't often approach um, looking at these texts in this kind of way. Why might that be the case, do y'all think? Why would we avoid these sorts of conversations? I, I have some theories. I don't know, but I'm curious what y'all think about that question. Uh, you know, I encountered that in science. You know, they use a model that they know isn't right, you know, uh, some kind of little picture of molecular stuff or whatever. And then Later on, they've got to relearn it, you know, and unteach you if they really want to take you to another level. But it's certainly good for, for uh, you know, shepherding the sheep, you know, whatever. That's my thought, thoughts about it. You know? Yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, Keith. Yeah. Well, I think if anybody thought, uh, if anybody heard that um, we don't really know what Jesus said and we don't really know who wrote it down, then the, for them, the whole, uh, the whole, church the whole purpose of the church would just fall apart mm -hmm. it introduces a level of uncertainty yeah. that is, is just too uncomfortable yeah yeah and weren't they seeking power at the point that point the, the church wanted to control mm -hmm. things and have power mm -hmm. That's well and you know yeah, and I mean, absolutely. And, and there was there was definitely an effort to consolidate. Again, we'll get into this more next time when we talk about that canonization process, but it was about consolidating power and consolidating a story and having an identity with rather than having all these different Christian communities, there was an effort to say, well, here's what we're actually going to believe. Some people believed that Jesus, for instance, didn't have a physical body, that that was an illusion, that he was, in fact, a spiritual being in the shell, sort of, of a, of a body. Well, that idea was something that not everyone was comfortable with. And so the canonization process said, well, here's what the doctrine is. Here are the books we're allowed to read. So, yeah, it is. The power is certainly a part of that. Yeah. Anyone else wanted to want to talk about that a little bit before we move on? Okay, well, let's dive into the Gospels in order, not of the way they appear in the New Testament, but rather in order of their suspected date. So I'm going to start with the, the Gospels, the canonical Gospels, meaning the Gospels that actually made it into the New Testament, because there are Gospels that did not make it into the New Testament, which we'll talk about. So the Gospel of Mark, the authorship date unknown specifically, but the best guess out there is somewhere between 65 and 70 CE. And the context was during the reign of Emperor Titus, 
uh, the Roman Emperor Titus. And the primary concern, or one of the primary concerns rather, is oriented around the reality that the temple, just as we said, had been destroyed. And so there's a long moment in the, in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is having a conversation with uh, some of his followers about the temple itself. And so I'm going to pull this up so that y'all can see it. One second. This is from Mark chapter 13. Let's see. Can y'all see that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's let's read this together. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings, referring to the temple. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are all the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. <clears throat> it's some heavy stuff. And the way Mark has written this gospel is the person named Mark that were tradition holes wrote the gospel anyway, <clears throat> is that Jesus is predicting something that Mark already knows happened. And so there's this description of don't rely on the temple. Don't focus on that. The center of gravity of your faith isn't there because that's all going to come down. Again, Jesus is predicting this. And so, and, but for Mark and the people reading, this is a reality that they're contending with. And so what we see then is Mark making an attempt to, one, we could say, elevate Jesus's prophetic status so that he's a person who had predicted a reality that all of these readers know came to pass. But there's also some theological work happening here where Jesus is saying that the temple isn't necessarily where your faith has to sit. Don't rely on that. Your faith is deeper than that. And, and, and also be prepared because you're going to be persecuted. Again, a reality that Mark already knew was happening. Any questions or comments about that passage and how it fits into this piece of our conversation? Tony, what was that citation again? Mark what? Mark 13, I think it's 1 through 14. Okay. So it, it seems to be the beginning of bringing it within and not without, outside. Yeah, but in terms of sort of practicing faith, kind of making right. it more inward. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And again, a, a sort of consolation uh, message around the reality of persecution 
because that was starting to happen. This is a couple hundred years before the kind of Roman imperial um, persecution that was a regular feature of Christian life. Um, at this point, the Roman Empire is just sort of deciding that as long as Christians are willing to coexist peaceably with the other people in their cities, then that's fine. But if they refuse to, for instance, worship at the altar of the emperor, then that's a problem. If they refuse to perform their duties as subjects of the Roman Empire, then that's a problem. But the, at this point, Christians weren't targeted explicitly, but persecutions were still happening. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Gospel of Matthew. So this text is dated somewhere between 80 and 85 in the Common Era. Um, it comes first in the Gospels, again, because tradition held that Matthew was the first Gospel and Mark was an abridged version of it. And Matthew takes special care. I mean, the, one of the very first things that happens in the Gospel of Matthew is that the Gospel traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to the beginning of time, to the beginning of the Jewish people. And so what Matthew is really concerned about is retaining a sense of Jewish identity within the Jewish um, Jesus movement. To say that there's a continuity, actually, rather than a break, that Jesus is part of Judaism. And so being a follower of Jesus means that you are also taking part in a Jewish tradition. And so Matthew does a number of things, makes a great number of scriptural references to the Hebrew scriptures to make the point that Jesus is part of a continuity and that in fact was predicted in the Hebrew scriptures and is fulfilled in Jesus's life and ministry. And so we see a sense of um, Matthew doing the work to preserve Judaism while at the same time acknowledging that the Jesus movement is becoming increasingly Gentile, that there are more and more folks who are not Jewish, who do not know Jewish laws and customs, but are intrigued by the teachings and witness of Jesus and, and being part of those communities. And so that effort to kind of bring these two different groups of people together, scholars suggest, is partly why Matthew tells the infant story of Jesus in A, the fact that he tells it at all, because only he and Luke actually tell the story of Jesus' birth. But if you remember in Luke, it's shepherds who come to visit Jesus. Whereas for Matthew, it's the Magi. And the Magi are these people from the East who are not Jewish. And so this is significant in the sense that what Matthew is saying is that Jesus, yes, is a, a Jew, and yes, is someone who is following and preserving a continuity of Jewish tradition and teaching. However, he is someone who can appeal to Gentiles. And so here's a painting by a German, um, a German artist named Matthias Stom, who is depicting the three kings slash magi and their presentations of gifts to Jesus. What stands out to y'all about this painting? <laughs> I'm just kind of tripped out by the little guy that's looking at us like if we're a photographer or something like he just you know, looked over while we were talking. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, know, I think right? it's so fascinating that he's the only one that looks at the viewer. Yeah, absolutely. It's and just to your point, Keith, it's sort of like he looked over when everyone else was when everyone else heard cheese. He just happened to look over, and it was the wrong. <laughs> yeah, but he's he's engaging us, right? He's looking at we're part of this scene. We too are at in this moment, um, being presented the baby Jesus. Anything else stand out to you? Of course, the two African faces. Yeah, it's interracial, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we've got these these two folks here who are clearly black. And that is a result of the fact that, again, the Gospel of Matthew just says yeah. three magi from the East. Tradition, however, has given these three men names, origin stories, whole backgrounds that aren't retained in the Gospels. And in one of those stories, um, one of the three kings, I can't remember what his, which one it is, um, I think it may be Balthazar, Balthazar is um, from an African country. And so that carries on in throughout Christian tradition, particularly in Europe, um, even until today, where there are on Epiphany, the moment in the Christian calendar where we celebrate the Magi making it to the baby Jesus, people will dress up like the three kings in these parades. And so you can find lots of pictures of Spaniards and French folk and all kinds of people dressing up in these ways. And some of them are in blackface because tradition holds that one of the three kings was black. So, but again, this is, this is part of what this story does. It says that you too, you Gentiles are part of this story of this Jewish king, this Jewish prophet, this Jewish teacher coming to change the world. There's also um, just one of the uh, Magi with Jesus. They're making this intimate connection eye to eye. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's sure. some energy passing between them. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's intimate, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Almost like the baby Jesus is about to grab that man's beard in kind of a sweet way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and of course, while we notice that we've got these two folks, probably one of the, the kings and, and someone in his entourage are black, it's very clear that Mary and Jesus are white. Jesus even has that blonde hair that we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. Again, th this is not historically accurate. It's not meant to be historically accurate. This is an invitation. This painting is an invitation for the contemporary followers of this moment of Jesus to see themselves as part of the story, even so much so that they can say that the Holy Family shared ethnic qualities with them. Um, and that, and you see this happen throughout European history where Jesus has red hair for Dutch painters or German painters and black hair for Italian painters and blonde hair for German painters. It, it was part of a tradition of claiming this, this story for, for uh, the audience themselves. Any other thoughts or comments before we move to the next gospel? Okay, let's talk about Luke Acts. So Luke is thought of as a distinct gospel, right? Um, written maybe in 85 to 95. However, it is a, of a piece that includes Acts as well. The beginning of both of these books, there's an address to a person named Theophilus who is, according to tradition, um, very possibly a kind of elite Gentile who's considering the teachings of Jesus and wanting to explore them more. And so what Luke does is say, I'm going to write down a, 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 an account of the events that took place in Jesus's life, retaining information about Jesus's teachings, but then also what happened after Jesus died and was resurrected, the work, the acts of the apostles. And so Luke acts actually are sort of a combination of, of, of a single text. However, in the canon, they're broken up. We have the four gospels and we have acts and then we have the, the letters. Um, some versions of the Bible, more contemporary versions of the Bible actually will pair Luke and acts together to make it clear that that was the original intention of the author. But um, together, Luke and Acts make up almost 30% of the New Testament, the biggest book, uh, the 
a combination of books in the New Testament. And there's a sense among scholars that it was primarily addressed to Gentiles. And that's based on the fact that there's a lot of use of words like Jews and Israelites. And so there was a sense that this was sort of a, a text that was attempting to explain the witness of Jesus to people who were not familiar necessarily with Jewish tradition in the same ways that maybe Matthew's audience would have been. And so an interesting thing happens, um, both in the context of Luke and Matthew. And one, and, and that thing is, uh, or one of those things is, is that we get a sense of this idea of two or three gathering. I think a, lo a lot of us here probably know that phrase, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there also. Well, that wasn't an idea that was unique to Christianity. There are um, kind of Mishnah rabbinical Torah tracts that retain that exact same idea, almost with just a swapping out of words. So in um, a rabbinic commentary, it is said that, but if two sits together and the words between them are of Torah, then the Shekhinah is in their midst. The Shekhinah is a Hebrew word for divine presence, Holy Spirit, if we will, if, if you will. And so, again, there's a sense that We've got these two approaches, at least two approaches, to dealing with the reality that the temple has been destroyed. One of them is oriented around Jesus, and the other is oriented around the Torah and the divine presence that can be found in reading the Torah. And so Matthew just sort of writes that phrase that we just um that we just described together, whenever two or three are present in my name, I am there also. Luke, however, does it a little bit differently. And so rather than write that phrase, what Luke does is illustrate it in a story. And it's a story that only appears in the Gospel of Luke. And that is the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And so this is a story in which after Jesus' crucifixion, um, a couple of his disciples are walk, walking back to the city, and they look really downcast and sad, and a person appears to them and says, what's, what's wrong? Why do you look so sad? And they are like, what, did you not, are you not aware of the fact that all of this has taken place, the trial, the crucifixion, all of that? I mean, it's been kind of a big deal. And then Jesus walks with them and describes to them um, basically how this is all part of God's larger plan for the salvation of the world. And so here's a painting by um, an artist from um, Latin America. His name is Maximo Baraceda, and he is taking this story and centralizing it in his own context. And so what we have here is Jesus walking with the two travelers and they're blind because they can't see that it's him. In the gospel story, they are not actually blinded. Um, they, they don't have blindfolds on. They just aren't aware of the fact that Jesus is with them. When they realize it is when Jesus sits down with them and breaks bread. And then suddenly they become aware of the fact that it's Jesus who's been with them this whole time. And so here you can see Jesus is breaking bread and he's got sort of a bit of a, a, a lighter halo around his head and he's got wounds from the crucifixion. And so you have these, these two folks who are humbled and in awe um, of the fact that they are communing with Jesus in this way. And they have backpacks. And they've got backpacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here they are with them on, and here they are sitting down. What else do y'all notice about this painting? Anything else stand out to you? I wonder what that piece of paper is. Ah, that's a good question. 
It looks like it kind of looks like a napkin. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like it could be. Maybe the bread was wrapped in it. No, yeah. it must be their blindfolds that were taken. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Blind, blind. There you go. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, what we've got then is again an example of someone else taking a scriptural story and making it their own. And, and with a few kind of key details, it becomes readily clear that this is that story without even seeing the title. You've got these two people blindfolded with Jesus and you've got them sitting down at the table as he breaks bread, this man who has these wounds in his arms. That's the recipe. And so whether you can read or not, whether you are a priest or not, you can identify, or at least um, Baracero's audience can identify what this story is and how they fit into it too. Any final questions or comments about this particular painting? Hey, Tony, this is Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Excuse me for doing this blindfolded, but Michael just had a good spot. Yeah. The the gentleman that is sitting um, to Jesus' left, uh -huh. yes, what is his hand significant, significant of? Is he just fed himself, or is he realizing maybe who Jesus is? Yeah, I, he's, he's surprised. And yeah. He's happy. Amazement that he, this is Jesus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, everybody, their hands are very prominent. Yeah. That the hands are all delivering some type of uh, communication. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you notice that Jesus looks like them. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, there's not there's not an ethnic difference here. They're they're they seem to be all of the same people. That's right. And you know, I think that um, there's, there's a couple of elements that really stand out in the story from the gospel. And one is the, the disciples say after Jesus disappears, because as soon as Jesus breaks the bread and they realize that it's him, he disappears. And they say to each other, where are our hearts not burning on the road? And a sense that there was there was a knowing inside of them that they were in Jesus's presence, even if they couldn't articulate that. And so one way maybe to read his gesture is he's in awe, maybe his hand is, is coming down from his mouth, or maybe his hand is on his heart because he feels it burning. So there's, yeah, but it's true in this painting in particular, the hands, they, they're all very active and prominent and some some really remarkable ways. And also the girl is looking away. Um, it's as if she's beckoning someone that's not visually in the picture. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Just kind of her eyes cast over to this side for sure. Yeah. So it's a very inclusive kind of uh, feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And in that way, it sort of maybe reminds us of that little boy that we saw in the last painting who's looking <laughs> directly at the audience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk now a little bit about one of the more enigmatic gospels. <laughs> uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. And that is because they are basically offering a synopsis of Jesus's life that follows a pretty particular pattern. There are differences among them. Mark doesn't include an infancy narrative at all. Um, it begins with Jesus's baptism. Um, Matthew and Luke have disagreements about why it was that the Holy Family was going to Bethlehem, who it was that first visited Jesus after he was born. But they agree on some basic ideas around Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. They agree around um, some of the precipitating events that led to Jesus's crucifixion, particularly the turning over the tables in the temple. Um, John, though, has a different approach. And I mean, the beginning of John 
is so unique in the context of these gospels. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. What? I mean, it's just, there's a whole different approach to understanding who Jesus was that goes, stretches beyond Jewish tradition and prophecy to make a kind of cosmological claim about who Jesus is. Not just someone who's following in the continuity of Jewish prophets and Jewish teachings, but a being who existed before time. And so <clears throat> we, have, um, we have a really different approach here. And John was thought, is thought to have been addressed to um, a predominantly Gentile or maybe a Jewish Gentile community living outside of Judea or maybe a community who had been relegated to the margins by other Jews for the way it approached teaching about Jesus. And so John is known as kind of the more mystical of the Gospels. There's a lot of light, dark imagery. There's a lot of suggestion that the, the spiritual reality is the truer reality. Um, Jesus has Whereas in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is a little bit more subtle about his messianic qualities. And in fact, there's a lot of effort Jesus makes to hide that from people, where he just, he says things in parables and then explains them only to his trusted crew later on. In John, Jesus is proclaiming all the time, basically, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Um, Jesus is much bolder and, um, and, and much more forthright about what his presence in the world means. And so, I want to share with y'all um, an interesting painting that kind of captures, I think, some of that kind of mystical quality of Jesus's life and Jesus's message and Jesus's presence in the Gospel of John. This is a painting by Salvador Dali. That oh. is his take on the Last Supper. And take a look. What do you what do you see here? Ooh. A blonde Jesus. A very blonde Jesus. It's almost platinum blonde Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is hiding their eyes. Yeah. yeah. And they're in robes. Like almost like Eucharistic garments. Yeah. And above well, like, above Jesus is that that figure. Uh-huh. And he's pointing at him. Right. Yeah. And Jesus looks almost effeminate in that picture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No beard. Um, kind of a petite, slim um, body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of androgynous a little bit. And there's like no supper. <laughs> yeah, this isn't so much a meal as it is literally bread <laughs> and wine. Right. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, the setting is is interesting. Not only this kind of idyllic mountain landscape with the still water, but I mean, this architectural structure that they're in, it looks like a spaceship or something. Um, I think this painting is fascinating. I think it's beautiful. And it's just... I don't think anyone would, or certainly Salvador Dali would make any claims that this is meant to be a, an historically accurate depiction of what took place at the Last Supper. He's reading into Jesus's life and presence, this kind of mystical quality. Everyone's head is bowed. They're wearing these robes that maybe echo, as some of us have been saying, priestly garb during um, the Eucharist. And Jesus is glowing, and there's this disembodied mystical figure above him that um, that is almost is 
barely half a torso mm -hmm. with the arms outstretched. And, and so again, I, th I think this painting kind of captures some of the, I, I think John would have liked this painting. I think the, the author of, of the Gospel of John would have appreciated the, its, its treatment even of bodies. And the, the emphasis isn't so much there as it is on this larger mystical quality that um, is a little bit inexplicable. Is there, on, and on the arms, it looks as though there's stigmata on the hands outstretched. Here? On, mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Is, I don't know if that's a foretelling or... I... Yeah, well, you know, it could be sort of a collapsing of, of time periods and whatnot, yeah. All right. Any other comments mm -hmm. or, or questions about this painting or the Gospel mm -hmm. of John? And no, no head on that figure. So again, uh, it, and it's not a... While it looks strong, it doesn't look... Uh, and it looks kind of male, but yeah, yeah. yeah but this really <laughs> isn't uh, some sort of buff, masculine, uh, <laughs> weightlifting Jesus. <laughs> no, I didn't think it looked so much like a spaceship. I thought it looked more like a church mm -hmm. with with the communion table in the middle. Uh -huh. hmm. Yeah, definitely. That definitely has kind of a, a, a communion table vibe to it. And yeah, and this architecture here, sure, maybe just some kind of um, church-like fixtures. Yeah. Well, I'm going to um, end us with just, we'll have more conversation about Paul as time goes on. Um, but <clears throat> I'm going to just quickly close us with a rundown of what texts ended up becoming authoritatively known as Paul's texts and which ones are either subject to debate or thought to not be Paul's at all. So um, the texts that are thought of as Paul's letters that we consider authoritatively Paul, um, there's only seven of them. So Galatians, Corinthians, first and second, Romans, 1st Thessalonians, Philippians, and Philemon. And these are actually older than the gospel texts, all of them. Galatians is dated to be around 48 CE. So that's about 20 years before the gospel of Mark would have been written. And then the latest is Philemon, which would have been written, they think, around 62 CE, which again is maybe 10 years or so before the gospel of Mark would have been written. Now, there's a lot of other letters that are attributed to Paul, 2 Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, Timothy, Titus, that scholars are either uncertain um, about whether or not they were written by someone who was writing in Paul's name, or um, in the case of Timothy 1 and 2 and Titus, they are certain that Paul did not write those letters. And so... Looking at Paul's letters, though, and just or the letters attributed to Paul, what we see is a real shift away from starting with Galatians, all of this language about there being no longer Jew or Greek, no longer male or female, no longer slave or free for all are one in Christ. Then as we make our way to the texts that um, were likely not written by Paul, Colossians, first and second Timothy, we get a whole different approach to gender and the slave status, where we get Paul saying, women must obey their husbands, slaves must obey their masters. And so what scholars think happened is that as Christianity continued to grow and become a wider spread movement, tensions started to arise with Christians who are more grounded in a sort of egalitarian approach to community building and the norms of the societies that they were in. And so there was an effort, scholars think, people writing in Paul's name to say, we need to look a little bit more like mainstream society. We can't stand out in all of these kinds of ways. 
um, because it's going to put us at risk. And so we need to do a little, this isn't to say that in every single one of Paul's letters, uh, the ones that are definitely written by Paul, there aren't problematic places, but we see as we move farther and farther away from Paul's voice, a deeper and deeper effort to reiterate the norms of the wider society rather than challenge them in the way that Paul did. And so next time we get together, we're gonna, we'll go more into that and we'll talk about why it was that some of these letters made their way into the canonical, canonical New Testament. And we'll talk a little bit about the books that didn't make it in. Um, the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, did not make it into the New Testament canon, mm -hmm. even though scholars think it's older, that it was written more like 60 CE. Um, the God, there's a gospel according to Mary. There's a gospel according to Judas. There's a gospel according to Philip. There are several different apocalyptic gospels, um, or rather writings. Revelations is the one that we know that makes it into the gospel, but there's also an apocalypse according to Peter, and an apocalypse according to, um, to a whole variety of different folks. And so next week we'll talk about what the process was for selecting the New Testament books that became part of the canonized Bible. We'll talk about some of the debates that took place around uh, theology, around understanding who Jesus was, how Jesus related to God. <laughs> Is Christianity a monotheistic religion or isn't it? And if so, then how do we make sense of these competing ideas around what Jesus was and what he taught? Um, we'll talk about some of the politics that were involved in making these decisions. And, and that will set us up to talk about, um, once we get a kind of a sense of how that context formed, then that will set us up to start moving into thinking about, well, how do we interpret these texts? What are the various ways that people have interpreted them? And what does that mean for how we might interpret them today? Any final questions or comments before we close for the day? Yeah, Joel. Oh, we can't hear you, Joel. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yes. My comment is Jesus did actually exist. However, his name was actually Yehuda. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that, Joel. It's true. Yeah. Yehuda, <laughs> Yeshua. Yeah, Jesus probably spoke Aramaic rather than Greek. And so the words that we have, the name Jesus that we have, is a Greek translation of, um, of a Hebrew Aramaic name. Yeah, it's true. You know what this reminds me of? Hmm. Nowadays, we have what's called fiction writing and nonfiction writing. And I believe that's also in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some of it came as absolute truth and some of it was a story. So it's, that's what it reminds me of, you know, that it makes for good reading, but we don't know which ones were true and which ones were made up. Well, and it's, you know, what it points out, Joy, too, um, is that even in nonfiction texts, for instance, I just saw that there was a book about Her Herbert Hoover that came out recently. Why are we talking about Herbert Hoover today? Why is that biography of that man relevant today? Well, I mean, it has a lot to do, according to the author, with the formation of the contemporary Republican Party. And so all that to say is that even now, whenever we're writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, we're thinking about who our audience is today. Who is going to be reading this and why does it matter to them? And, so, and that was certainly true for, for the scripture you know, for the, um, the gospel stories. But they were even, historically speaking, less interested in the distinction between actual historical fact and imagined reality than we are. And so we'll see even more of that as we pick up our conversation next week. And so with that, I want to thank you all so much for being here. And I look forward to being with you next week if you're able to make it. These recordings will be put in the Congo Beat and, um, and I 
think maybe on the website. But speaking of the website, if you do need to find the Zoom link and you can't find it in your emails, if you go to the website and you click on programs, you'll see it right there. All right, y'all. Thank and you. That's so been much. super handy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Whoosh. <laughs>